let me start um, by thanking the, the first peoples of this land and for welcoming me here as a guest. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm profoundly honored. Um, I'm profoundly interested in, in learning from you as much as you're willing to, to teach me. And I would love the opportunity and, and consider this a formal invite to welcome you someday to my ancestral lands of Jordan and Palestine. I want to thank also all the organizers and, and, and co-sponsors. Uh, it was quite an impressive list that everybody had, had put together. Um, and, uh, uh, and uh, Sheila Delaney and, and Paul Sidra particularly for, for uh, their, their introductions and to you all for, for coming. Um, I'll try not to yammer for too long. I can't make any promises. I, I tend to go on, on tangents, which is what led me to Twitter in the first place. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm interested in setting aside time for questions. So if there's something that, that you feel like you want to argue with me about or press me further on, um, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll be happy to, to, to do it. And one final qualification. Um, I'm not native, aboriginal. As uh, you'll have to excuse my um, um, American vocabulary, I'm trying to uh, tailor it uh, appropriately for for being north of of the border. Um, and as as such, uh, I'm not particularly interested in, nor do I feel it fully appropriate for me to represent a set of their cultures, politics, geographies, etc. I want to focus more on Palestine in relation to indigeneity and the relationships of those doing Pal Palestine solidarity work on colonized land here in North America. Just so you know more about who I am, who you're dealing with be, beyond uh, the the beyond the guy who got fired? Um, I was born in in I was born in the U.S. on the the Virginia West Virginia border in southern Appalachia. My mother is from Nicaragua, and her parents are from Palestine, and they're from the the villages. Uh, my grandfather of Ein Karim, which is in in West Jerusalem, it was ethnically cleansed in '48, and my and um, and then Beit Jala, which is um, adjacent to to Bethlehem, uh, probably about five six miles south of 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 Jerusalem. Although it can take all day to to make the trip if it's even possible at all. My father is from a, a traditional uh, Bedouin clan of of Jordanians, or as they like to call themselves, somewhat uh, chauvinistically Jordanian Jordanians, meaning uh, Jordanians not of of Palestinian origin, uh, from a town called uh, Madaba, which is uh, to the southwest of Amman. It's kind of in between Amman and, and the Dead Sea, and it's an old biblical town. That's the, uh, in it, or right next to it, is Mount Nebu, where um, Moses uh, supposedly saw the promised land of, of Palestine for the, the, the first time. So uh, that's, that's kind of my subject, um, positionality. So I want to, I, I want to look at aspects of my firing that haven't often been discussed in, in corporate media, but that have been subject to, to some discussion within academic and activist communities. I'm especially interested in situating my firing not in, in the context of sort of adjudicating myself of, of any wrongdoing, but looking at how it informs a set of questions that are crucial to us both inside and outside of academe. That's the corporatization of the university, the meanings and practices of academic freedom, the status of American Indian or indigenous studies, 
on campus. The repression of Palestinian voices along with the repression of serious discussion of Palestine or on the inverse, criticism of Israel. And the way that these forms of repression influence our ability to take up the study of indigenous peoples in a way that's not only intellectually productive, but in ways that are materially useful as well. One thing I've heard throughout my life that, that I don't dispute, I, I have no reason to dispute it, and those of you who are of Arab or Jewish origin have probably heard the same thing at, at, at some point in your life, that Jews and Arabs have much in common, right? You know, uh, we, we, have, uh, we share an ancestral origin. We share a set of, of cultural practices, right? We, we, we share a conflict, right? And, and, and that's something, even if it brings us together as antagonists, that still brings us together, right? It, it, we're not holding hands over it necessarily, right? But, uh, but it, also, it has also brought Jews and Arabs very closely together, right, in opposition to many Israeli policies, right, and the practices of settler colonization in Palestine. But when we're talking about Jews and Arabs in, in North America, right, here's one thing that we share in common that is absolutely crucial to our activism on behalf of Palestinian human rights. The fact that in North America, both Jews and Arabs are settlers. The fact that we're settlers gives us something productive in common and gives us a basis to develop a more complex form of engagement with the Israel-Palestine conflict. When we, when we share ideas or argue, about um, Israel-Palestine, right? Uh, sometimes the arguments sort of descend into a, uh, you know, into, into a back and forth about who the land really belongs to historically and contemporaneously. Right? So, well, the Palestinians are the indigenous peoples. No, the land is indigenous to, to, to Jews. And that, that kind of situation around indigeneity sort of informs a lot of people's politics around the conflict. My viewpoint, and, and I think it's a sound viewpoint, I'm biased, um, is that the, the Palestinians are clearly indigenous to the land. Their culture grew up on that land. Their sense of identity grew up on that land. Their sense of identity remains attached to that land, even though many of them don't live on the land or in physical proximity to the land. And I always go back to David Ben-Gurion's prediction. I don't even like calling him David Ben-Gurion. David Green, that's his real name. Uh, David Green's prediction that, uh, that the Arabs would you know, forget the homeland in a generation or two and everything would be easy sailing. He was wrong that the Arabs would forget about the land. The Palestinians would, would just, just forget about it. In fact, it seems to me as, as somebody of Palestinian origin born here in North America that our attachment to that land, our sense of identity being tied into that land is stronger than it ever has been. Right? I have a young son, he's two years old. I'll make sure that he understands the importance of our attachment to that land. It's something that is going to continue and it's something that that attachment that's impervious right, to militarization. It's impervious to weapons. It's impervious to bombs. It's something that no amount of physical violence can stamp out. And that's the particular power right, that Palestinians bring to bear on the conflict. The simple fact that they refuse to forget and they refuse to give up their claims to indigeneity. We don't have that argument in North America, though, right? And it's important that we don't. 
we can say that, that we're rooted in North America, but I think it's important for us to acknowledge that we're rooted in North America as, as, as settler. I mean, think about the term um, immigrant, right? An immigrant is an accurate way to describe a lot of the Jewish and Arab and South Asian and East Asian populations that have ended up here in North America. But I think we use immigrant so incessantly, even a few generations down the line, to conceal right, a, a, a more powerful word, a more descriptive word, and that is the word of, of, of settler, which positions us in a disparate circumstance of power vis-a-vis -vis the indigenous populations of these lands that we've settled and, and continue to inhabit. So when we come together to work on behalf of Palestine, it's equally crucial that we recognize that we're doing this work from a colonized space in which we're directly implicated, that, that we have a set of interests in, and that on this space, we have a set of relationships to this land's original inhabitants. And in that sense, right, we need to attach our understanding of settler colonization in Palestine to histories of ongoing settler colonization in North America from which we have benefited in ways that are both tacit and explicit. And I'll, I'll, a quick story to, to, to illustrate from my point of view one of the ways that, that we've benefited from it. Um, as I mentioned, I grew up in a, in a very small town in, in Appalachia and we were one of the few, at that time, one of the few immigrant um, families or settler families if you want to call it that. Um, you know, there were a few others, but uh, there just weren't very many brown people there. There was a significant black population, right, and a sort of significant um, Italian population. Both of them had, had arrived to become laborers um, in the coal mines. This is coal country that, that, that I grew up in, coal mining country. And the whites and blacks in, in my town, it's called Bluefield, were strictly separated, and we actually had railroad tracks, you know, uh, separating the white side of town from the black side of town, right? So the, the term, you know, the metaphor across the tracks uh, wasn't actually a metaphor back in Bluefield. It, it described a spatial reality. And having a Nicaraguan mother who, you know, Spanish is her first language, she was the Spanish teacher at the high school, so everybody in Bluefield thought she was Mexican. I don't know if that problem exists in, in, in Canada, but uh, you know, any Spanish speaker in, in, in the US is by and large Mexican, right? That's just, just kind of the way it is, right? So I had a Mexican mom and, um, you know, and, a, uh, and a God knows what father. He could be anything from Moroccan to Indonesian, right? Uh, you know, uh, somebody, uh, 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 somebody from, from that, that vast geography known in the Orientalist imagination as Islamo land, right? He was from there. And so it was kind of a double whammy. And I used to complain to, to my parents about, you know, the, the, the nonsense I always heard, the xenophobia, and in some cases, outright racism. And my dad's attitude was typical of a Middle Eastern immigrant, right? Shut up, keep your head down, pull up your bootstraps, and do well in school anyhow. All right, that, that's his answer to everything, you know, um, you know just, just do well in school, you know, hard work overcomes all, and you shouldn't be thinking about anything else besides becoming an engineer or a doctor, of which, and I became neither. So uh, anyway, um, you know, my mom always had a different answer, though. She'd tell me, you, you have it better than people who were born in this country and who've been in this country for generations. I go, what do you mean? You know, well, there are... We get to live in a neighborhood that plenty of people who were born in the United States don't get to live in, right? And she was, of course, talking about African Americans. And I used to think that it was, uh, that, that my mother's narrative was just a reconfiguration of my dad's uh, Horatio Alger uh, bootstrap story. But it, it turns out that, that she was trying to inculcate me into some sort of understanding of structural racism that we entered into the United States, right? And as soon as we did, we came embroiled in a particular racial hierarchy, whether we wanted to be or not. Right? And within that racial hierarchy, we could be white enough to benefit from the existence of white supremacy. 
all the immigrants in Bluefield from the time of my childhood and onward, from South Asia, East Asia, the Middle East, etc., live in white neighborhoods. Not a single one went to a black neighborhood, right? The neighborhoods are still segregated, strictly segregated along a black-white axis even today. And so my mom compelled me to think about the ways in which, despite the persistent xenophobia, the ways in which we benefited from a, a type of anti-black racism. Then many years later, I went to college and I started learning about Native Americans, indigenous peoples, etc. And I understood that our sense as immigrants, and my parents were very progressive along the line of racial politics, right? Uh, very progressive. They had zero sense of the space as, as a colonized land. They had zero conception of Bluefield or any other place in, in America as being subject to ongoing colonization. I grew up like most American kids with an idea that bad things had happened to the Indians, right? That's, that's, that's how we grow up in the US. You know, bad things happened, but it was all for the, the greater good, right? Look what came of their displacement. You know, this great democracy that we enjoy could not have come into existence without, you know, a few bad acts here and there and eh, you know, whatever. It was all worth it, right? But absolutely no sense that indigenous peoples are still alive, that they're still constituted as nations, that they are still fighting to gain full control over their land bases and their legal systems and fighting for self-determination and sovereignty or to put it uh, in less uh, like academic terms, liberation. And that made me recognize the, the landscape on which I grew up and in which I came into existence as an intellectual being was one profoundly compromised by the persistence of colonial narratives. Because the idea that bad things had happened to the Indians, but they're not problems anymore, is, if nothing else, a distinctive colonial narrative. It's a colonial narrative of erasure. It's a colonial narrative that de-emphasizes responsibility. It's a colonial narrative that tells us we don't have to engage these issues because they don't exist anymore. And anyway, you're not responsible for it because you didn't live 100 or 200 years ago. And so we all have to continue undergoing this process of, of unlearning those, those discourses and narratives and replacing them right, with the new knowledge that, that, that we can pick up from indigenous peoples, from the people in Palestine, and so forth. In just a second, I'm going to sneak some water. My hire at the University of Illinois, having been in American Indian Studies, is critical to my termination. And I think it's something that we ought to keep in mind um, when, when thinking about or, or discussing you know, this, this um, situation, which gets couched very frequently, almost exclusively at times, in, in the discourses of academic freedom. And those discourses of academic freedom are extremely important and they're extremely germane to the case, but the, the, the case informs other broader, I would argue, more important matters. I don't think that it would have been so easy, if I can use that word, right? I, I, say, I say easy based on the amount of thought that the administrators uh, appeared to put into it, which is none, right? Uh, you know, I, it, it wouldn't have been so easy for them to, to have made 
this decision had I been in another department. The fact that it was in AIS, American Indian Studies, um, is, is, is a crucial factor because AIS at the University of Illinois has long had a tense, at times antagonistic, relationship with the administration. So there were, there were a whole series of problems that preceded and foregrounded right, uh, my, uh, my termination. And one of them has to do with the persistence of Chief Illini Wick. Do I need to explain Chief Illini Wick? OK, I'll do it very quickly. Uh, well, he's a mascot. Uh, I don't even need to, to, to explain too much further. But uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a mascot from like uh, a fake tribe. Um, and, and, and he's fake in all the other ways that, uh, that Indian mascots tend to be. He dances around at their at halftime of their basketball and, and football games. And his, uh, his, his motto is Oski Wow Wow. Which, um, which is actually derived from um, an indigenous language. It's true. It's called Tonto Ease. Um, you know, and, and he, he says Oski Wow Wow, and he has a scowl. He always has like a huge um, um, scowl, and he sits there like this. So he's always, and, and he scowls, and he always looks solemn, even when he's dancing. It's, it's quite the performance, uh, in a bad way. Well, Illinois was forced to retire the chief in 2007, but of course they haven't retired the chief at all. And I know that you've probably been to places or live in places where the settler attachment right, to Indian symbology is extremely strong, but I promise you it is not as strong as the attachment of the people in Illinois to Chief Illini Wick. They went absolutely batshit crazy when, when they got rid of that mascot. There's a Facebook page called Bring Back the Chief or Save the Chief. Check it out. It's got like 55,000 likes last time I looked at it. And it is an amazing testament to a type of, and note I said a type of, white psychology, right, wherein their sense of identity and their, their sense of self-esteem is completely tied into what amounts to, because this is what mascots are in the US, a corporate icon. Right? It's a brand. It's a corporate brand. So it's, it's a problem of capitalism as much as it is a problem of, of representation. Right? We're, we're, it's brand loyalty. And you know, every time I, I visit the page, because I, I, I've done some writing about the chief, and so I have to visit the page and get material, it, it always comes to my mind. It's like, well, these poor people don't need an Indian mascot. They need a grief counselor, right? They really, you know, they, they do. You know, there's, it's, they, they talk as if somebody in their family had died. And, and I'm joking, but I'm not joking, right? That this is, this is the kind of discourse that, 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 that you hear. And so the chief is informally everywhere on the campus, everywhere, on cars, on t-shirts. Uh, he, he, he turns up at, at, at football games and basketball games, you know, in the stands. He's, he's, he's not allowed to go to the court or to the football field, but he's always there, right? And so, so the, 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 the chief is still an omnipresent symbol. And the folks in AIS have been working hard to curtail that without much success. And their work to eradicate this, this ridiculous chief imagery, and it's more than just chief imagery, right? Uh, uh, corresponding racist narratives right, grow up around the, 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 the chief and then get put into circulation. They're, they've, they're deeply resented, the AIS people, by a significant portion of the campus community, including administration, and by a significant portion of the Champaign-Urbana community as well. Also, I don't know why the University of, of Illinois, which it's, it's the flagship institution of a state that doesn't have a, a considerable native population. I don't know exactly why you know, they, they invested money in an American Indian Studies program about 15 years ago, but uh, the people in AIS grew it to be through a tremendous amount of, of work and vision, grew it to be one of the most distinguished 
departments of American Indian studies in, in North America. It's a remarkable, remarkable collection of, of faculty who do fabulous research and, and who, are just, who are wonderful people. But I, I think the fact that they do fabulous research and are wonderful people and contravenes the, the administration's original desire that the department exist to placate those who were upset by Chief Illini Weck and as a feather in the diversity cap, right? They, they, they wanted, a, they wanted a, a, a department that would look good in their glossy brochures, but certainly not a department that was gonna cause trouble, right? That was actually gonna be interested, in other words, in doing an American Indian studies, you know? That's, because an American Indian studies and indigenous studies necessarily causes a university trouble, right? It, it, it cannot perform his work, its work unless it is causing trouble to colonialist institutions. So my being in that department is, has been critical. And if, 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 if you can in, indulge me just for, for a moment, um, I, I don't know why I, I was hired. And, and pe people laugh at me when I say that, but I really don't. Um, you know, I, I wasn't there when, um, when the search committee was, was making its decision. I don't know who the other finalists were. All I know, like many academics, is that I applied. I went through a year of hazing, you know. <laughs> I got offered the job. I accepted it, right? And they didn't tell me, you know, we hired you for ABC reasons. This is what our discussion behind closed doors looked like. This is who you finished behind. This is who you finished ahead of. We offered X, Y, and Z before you. They all said no, so you were fourth on the... Not, you know, these are things that, that happen normally in search. And I have no idea what went on, which is one reason why I'm so amused when... Um, when uh, when, uh, you know, uh, just a, a collection of half-baked imbeciles keep talking about, uh, oh, you know, they hired Salida for this reason or that reason. Like, you don't know why Salida was hired at all. Salida doesn't know why Salida was hired, right? Uh, you know, so why don't you just drop that narrative? But, uh, but there, there, there was interest in transitioning to an indigenous studies that would have more of a global scope and they were interested, uh, and, and at the time I was hired, I think they had eight full-time faculty. Those eight full-time faculty were unanimously interested in accommodating Palestine in this move to a more global focus, right? And, and, and so my work in, in, in Palestine, they saw as, as, as complementary of their, their vision as, as, a, as a program. And so when the administration made its, its decision, it, it, it didn't just affect me personally, although it did that. Uh, it had severe negative consequences for the department. Right? And the department has suffered terribly. You know, their workload has increased dramatically this semester. And I, I always want people to remember the folks in, in the department, right? They're, you know, and, and send some of your love and, and energy and support to them. They've had a, an extremely difficult semester. They had to cover my classes. You know, they, they've had to hear the racism, right? And, and suffer all kinds of, of administrative indignities. They've been told over and over again tacitly or explicitly, that they're not qualified to make their own hiring decisions. They've been dismissed. They've been subject, in other words, to the full array of colonial logic that governs the practices and ethos of the modern American university. The decision killed an idea just as much, if not more, than it killed a career or killed a department, right? I don't believe that the, the administrator sat down and said, oh, wow, you know, their, their, their modes of decolonization are, are going international, right? They're, they're starting to include Israel, right, as, as, a, as a 
colonial entity, right, that, that in many ways is separable from the, the, the US as a colonial entity. We gotta stop this. And the reason I don't think they did that is because I, 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 I don't think they're that smart. You know, I, I, you know, I, I think that, that that was just a, you know, inadvertent benefit of it. But we, we don't look at, at, at intent as critics, right, when we're, when we're trying to figure out, uh, uh, the, you know, a, a particular phenomenon. We, we, we look at, at results. And the result of their decision was to have smashed this, this idea and smashed this move before it could be implemented and put into practice. And I'm not gonna say that, that it would have worked beautifully. I could have gotten there, they all could have hated me. You know, they could have said, you know what, all of a sudden your work stinks, so uh, you're not gonna become full professor and, and you know, we, we encourage you to leave. I don't know what was gonna happen, right? But we never got the chance to, to find out. Right? We never got the chance. And I say that because it's absolutely indicative of a particular administrative attitude, at least in, in, in the US. I'm guessing it's the same in Canada, but I can't speak authoritatively to that. A particular administrative attitude that views these sorts of material commitments not only as fiscally problematic, right, but also as philosophically undesirable, right? They, they don't want us making connections among colonial entities. They don't want us examining the modes of a neoliberal imperialism vis-a-vis -vis indigenous communities in different parts of the world who share a profound interest in analyzing these iniquitous structures in concert with one another, right? That goes against everything that the corporate or the imperial university stands for. The corporate and the imperial university desires docility. It desires grant money for the STEM fields. Right? It desires a type of knowledge production that always, in the end, supplements the practices of state power. That's what the corporate imperial university desires. It does not desire academic units, right, and, and, and academics themselves who are interested in situating the university itself Right? within these broader processes of imperialism, continuing colonization, and so forth right? at the, at the state level. And the university is implicated in these things. I noticed it at UBC that uh, they, they call it, so actually I didn't notice, I'm lying. Somebody told me, and the person who told me is probably, probably in this room, right? told me that it's, it's, it's on what they call university endowed lands. And in the U.S., uh, every state has, uh, I think every state, has what they call a, a land-grant university. The University of Illinois is, is the land-grant university. Usually it's the state flagship, not always. You know, in Virginia, it's Vir Virginia Tech is the land-grant institution and so forth. But even then, in this, in this kind of language, we see a complete disconnect from a particular historical reality. Who endowed that land? Right? Who decided that that land was endowable in the first place? And to whom was it endowed? Who, to whom was it granted? Who had the authority to grant it? These are indigenous lands. These are, that's the same thing with public lands. Public lands are actually indigenous lands. Right? And so the university, just by its physical existence, in many cases, is a colonial structure, literally and figuratively. But then in terms of its particular set of, of commitments, in terms of its, its supplication and supplementation of state power, they are colonialist institutions in terms of how they operate as well, in terms of, of how they have a remarkably sophisticated way of making sure that everything, everything remains within a particular 
boundary. And once somebody breaks across that particular boundary, the notions and the ideals of free speech and academic freedom go out the window. Um, one thing that, that I like us to think about, uh, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm coming at it from, from um, you know, a, a, a Yank point of view, right? Uh, Yankee point of view, because that's just, uh, th is that what you call Americans in Canada, Yankees? Or is that just a British thing? Am I, am I, am I insulting you all tacitly? I don't, I don't mean to. Uh, because I'm, I'm from the southern part of the US, so it, it's weird for, for me to ever refer to myself as a Yankee. But, um, you know, we, we talk about free speech, but free speech in, in terms of, of its discursive performances, think about it. In the US, we, we, have, some, um, we, we have some canonical examples of, of the glories of, of free speech. One of them is, is Fred Phelps and the Westboro Baptist Church. The Supreme Court allowed, allows them to, to protest service people's funerals. You know, the, uh, another canonical example is the KKK doing a march, this is probably 20 years ago, uh, in Skokie, Illinois, uh, through a heavily Jewish um, neighborhood. Another example happened at the University of Illinois. Uh, right around this time last year, we had that uh, polar vortex that, 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 that went all the way down to, to, to Florida. And it was like, I'm talking in Fahrenheit here. Don't even expect me to, uh, to, to know what the hell it is centigrade, right? Uh, you know, it, it became like 17 below um, in, in Champaign-Urbana. And the students were clamoring to cancel classes, and Phyllis Wise, the chancellor, decided to hold classes. And, and Phyllis Wise, if you've never seen her or, or don't know of her background, she's of Chinese origin. And Phyllis Wise was subject to horribly racist and sexist abuse on Twitter for not canceling classes under a hashtag called Fuck Phyllis, right? And, and you, you can imagine the, the horrible things that, that they were saying about her. And, she released a statement a, a day or two later saying, you know, I'm, I'm really disappointed in the way that they chose to express themselves, but they have rights of speech and th there's no reason that, that, that I should punish them based on that. And so what I'm talking about is, are articulations of extremism that challenge right, the, the liberal self-image of the multicultural state. Right? So free speech can accommodate those things. Right? Because in accommodating those things, it actually reinforces a certain sort of nationalistic narrative. Right? But when people challenge the basis and the structure of the state itself, right, free speech tends to go away. That's why you see people who engage in systemic structural analysis of racism or colonization getting into so much trouble, right? Because free speech does not accommodate right, uh, a, a rejection or a deep skepticism about the, the glories of, of, of the liberal state, right? Uh, it, it, the, 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 the liberal state, right, and its, its legal institutions, juridical institutions have to respond to it, to that sort of critique in different ways. And it does so by summoning right, the power of recrimination. Anybody, anybody who, who, who's worked with so-called radical ideas in, the, in, in North American universities knows extremely well right, how, this, how conformity to this particular limitation is coerced in ways both direct and indirect. Now, upper administrators, again, in the US, uh, they're, they're all uh, banging the, uh, the civility drum. Are they, are they doing that here, too? Are they talking about civility? Yeah, that's, 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 that's the new thing, right? Uh, it's actually an old thing. They've, they've been actually talking about civility for, for a while. But now they're doing it, it, it seems like, in a, in a systematic way. Right? It's like they all have like a conference and they're like, okay, you know, what's, what's a good word to use? You know, uh, <laughs> civility. All right, excellent. There's actually a shelf here. I know I'm going to end up spilling this water. Okay, so civility 
encodes all of the problems that I've been talking about and that so many other academics and activists have been analyzing you know, over, over the past five, six months and, and, and well before that also. Civility is the language of genocide. Civility calls into existence profoundly violent histories. Civility is the term most frequently used in European colonization around the entire world. That was the rationale for colonizing India, the rationale for colonizing the Arab world, Sub-Saharan Africa, North America, South America, East and Central Asia, Australia, New Zealand. Civility. It was always a binary of civilized versus savage, and a binary that ended up informing notions of modernity versus pre-modernity. I've been um, criticized a bunch for, for, for pointing out that a, a term like civility is deeply invested in violent histories, but I, I see no other way to analyze it. Right? People respond by saying, well, you can't actually believe that, that, that these people, they may be stupid, but they're not genocidal. I never said that they were genocidal. I said that the discourse they're using is genocidal, whether they're aware of it or not. And in fact, because they appear to be unaware of it, that shows us just how powerful the term is and just how easy it is in North America to recycle and reinscribe and normatize these histories of colonial violence and to keep them into existence and to continue practicing them, right? The fact that the administrators have no sense of what civility has done in the past, right? And, and I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt here, right? Makes it all the more insidious. That doesn't let them off the hook, right? It absolutely doesn't let them off the hook, right? It makes them even more complicit in a type of narrative that those of us who are working in indigenous studies and elsewhere have a profound interest in identifying, unpacking, and, and ultimately eliminating. And another way that, that this presents itself is, is through the university administration's justification of, of, of my firing, which was done not simply through the language of, of, of civility. You know, the administrators kept invoking the students, right? You know, the Salida is going to, he's going to saute and eat those students, right? Uh, you know, he can't, you know, we can't let those precious students in, in his classroom, terrible things are going to happen, right? Uh, you know, uh, uh, Salida won't make them feel comfortable. Right, uh, you know all, all of these uh, all of these inane platitudes, you know, um, you know about my um, abilities in the classroom, and and, and by the way, there's a, not a whit of evidence, none, nowhere, anywhere, right, that that I've ever mistreated a student ever, and all my my teaching career, I've, I've fielded zero student complaints, none, not a one. I know that there's a crew of people. I, I know this sounds conspiratorial, but it's 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 true. I know it, right? There's a crew of people, right. Uh, I, I, I wish that they would get a life, but apparently trying to find something bad about me is, is their life, who have dug through every single word I have ever written anywhere, right? I mean, they, they, they started going after my Goodreads reviews, right? I had to shut down my Goodreads account. They were like, oh my God, you know, look at the way he reviewed this book, you know? <laughs> he doesn't like Christopher Hitchens, you know? Holy shit, you know? Uh, you know, and it's just, you know, like really, on every word I have ever written, like they were pulling out shit from like 1998, you know? Uh, it, it just, it stunned me, you know? And, 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 and I know that they're looking, and I know that the legal team representing the university is looking for st former students and former colleagues who will come forward and say, this guy was a real asshole. He was a terrible teacher or he was a terrible colleague. They haven't found a single one, not a single one. So you tell me, right? 
who is more appropriate for university work. Right? Somebody who has no complaints about his teaching or his professional life versus somebody who makes extraordinary decisions based on extraordinary claims that don't have a single piece of evidence to support them. That shit will get you an F in English 101, right? You know, you, won't, you, you shouldn't pass undergrad if you don't understand that, that claims must be supported by evidence, right? So, but they're always talking about the students, right? And doing this for the students. And I'm going to go on another quick tangent. And then I'm going to forget where I was at. So if somebody would be kind enough to remind me that, that I was talking about um, the, 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 the students. If the administrators really want to help students, right? Firing me is not a good way to do it. Even if I were a horrible teacher, firing me is not going to help students. What will help students right, is cutting down on administrative bloat, in which we have dozens upon dozens, in some university systems, hundreds of administrators who are making $200,000 plus for doing nothing. Right? You know, they, they have like, campuses now have like seriously, like the associate provost, you know, for making sure underage drinking doesn't happen. You know, like they, they have just, the administrator's salaries are going up and up and up and up. University presidents in the U.S., um, many of them have $1 million plus annual packages, so forth and so on, right? It's a racket. It's a capitalist racket. If they want to help students, they can cut down on their tuition by cutting down on administrative bloat. If they want to help students, they can quit putting students in the classroom of adjunct and contingent faculty who are saddled with extraordinary teaching loads that don't leave them enough time to give students the proper attention. If they want to help students, they can quit infantilizing them and treat them like adults rather than as communities of consumers right, who the institution can exploit for profit at every possible moment. You think the proliferation of restaurants on college campuses right, you know, has anything to do with making sure the students are comfortable? Making sure they spend money on campus rather than off. They're consumers. They're not students. And many students are aware of that reality and react accordingly, which is inevitable. But anyway, I actually remembered where I was at, the students. I was thinking about, I've been thinking about students because when they say students won't be comfortable in, in my classes, I, I realize that students is not a neutral term, right? They're talking about normative students. Talking about white students or Jewish students even more particularly. So in one sense, they're totalizing Jews. Right? That's more anti-Semitic than anything I would have ever dreamed of saying my entire life. Right? Saying that, 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 first of all, Jews are too weak to handle ideas that, that don't suit them, which goes against right, every single intellectual tradition of the Jewish people for about 8,000 years. Right? Uh, also, it, 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 it's saying that they have a homogenous political worldview that doesn't distinguish and that is, is unwilling to entertain the very existence of an Arab at the front of the classroom. And that certainly hasn't been my experience throughout my life either, right? But what, about, what about the Palestinian student? What about the Muslim student? What about the black student or the indigenous student? Do the administrators ever fret about their comfort? When I was a student, I heard so much Orientalist shit almost every single week that it became extremely difficult sometimes for me to even go to class in the first place. I did because the administration didn't give a damn about my comfort. I had to suck it up and I had to go. Non-normative students had to do the same thing. Trans students, women students, ethnic minority students. They have to suck it up and go and they have to hear sometimes explicitly horrible things, sometimes implicitly horrible things, and very often they have to deal with a continuous set of microaggressions from both their professors and their peers. They have to do it. And if they go complain to the administration about it, right, 
Fox News isn't going to pick it up and, and express outrage, you know, on, ba on behalf of the precious students, you know, who are uncomfortable. In fact, that's why I feel like non-normative students leave college, those who make it to the end of college, with a much better education than their white male counterparts, right? We learn things in the classroom that other students, right, never learn because they don't have to. We come away with a different set of knowledge and a different experience that helps prepare us in a way for the professional world that, that, that we're about to encounter. So when the administration says students aren't going to be comfortable, it occurs to me that they're not talking about actual human beings. Students are just an invention. Right, of, the, of the administration's disposition. Right? They're not real. They're not talking about communities of, of actual people. Right? Students are being exploited. And they're being summoned as a stand-in for administrative discomfort. Right? It's the administrators who are uncomfortable. It's the donors who are uncomfortable. Yet they're outsourcing their discomfort to an imagined set of students who in reality don't exist and have never existed throughout my entire teaching career. And another thing that, that, that and I'm going to wrap up soon because I've been talking a lot and, and, and I, I do want to leave time for, for, for questions. I think also about the reasons that, that, that I was fired and, and beyond the, the, the fact that, that there's a colonial logic inscribed in it, beyond the fact that it happened in American Indian studies, beyond the fact that, that I've always made explicit my, my commitment to um, decolonization in North America in addition to Palestine. Um, you know, there's, there's I, I think my role in, in BDS, Boycott Divestment Sanctions, particularly the infamous ASA boycott resolution from uh, it's a little more than a year ago now, right? Uh, I, I published a lot of pieces um, supporting that that decision, and and I think that caught the attention of of uh, a number of organizations that specialize in in getting pro Palestine academics fired or harassed, or at the very least in some sort of of trouble. I remember during the debate about the ASA that. Opponents of BDS weren't defending Israel. Just like I noticed that during Operation Protective Edge, the slaughter in Gaza, that they weren't really defending Israel. Israel has become largely indefensible these days. It has. You can defend it on ideological or theological grounds. You can defend it in very abstract ways. But what was the one thing we heard during Protective Edge over and over and over about all those dead Palestinian children? Whose fault was it? It was Hamas's fault. It was the Palestinians' fault, right? So they were outsourcing their responsibility to the victims of, of, of the violence. And during the ASA, nobody or very few people were contesting the basic facts at hand that Israeli institutions are deeply complicit right, in Israel's military occupation. Very few people were contesting those facts. right? Go back, look at the literature, you'll see. They were contesting it on the grounds of academic freedom. Right? Well, fast forward about uh, you know, seven, eight months, I get fired. It's the exact same set of people who are lining up with the university administration in its decision to abrogate academic freedom and fire me. All right, so we can see how academic freedom acts as a red herring. We can see how it can have a coercive, discursive function, right? And we see how understandings of academic freedom can be profoundly inconsistent, right, based on the political outlook and desire of the person deploying the term. That's one reason why I'm a little bit tepid 
about understanding my situation with the University of Illinois simply through the prism of academic freedom. Because if you look at the way academic freedom has been deployed right, around conversations in my case and then the preceding boycott, you'll see that academic freedom has been distilled to little more than a shibboleth. Right? This is not to say that I want to get rid of academic freedom. I think that academic freedom is deeply important. I just don't think that academic freedom is particularly productive right, as an approach to understanding the constellation of issues that, that informs um, my firing and the, the, the arguments that, that have ensued from it. I'm going to go ahead and, 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 and take um, questions. I, you know, th this, is, this is really my first event uh, after, after a, a, a long um, holiday break, but last, last, last semester I, I, I was asked often, and, and I never mind the question, by the way, I don't. I'm not, I'm not complaining, I promise. Um, I was asked often about uh, you know, what, what, what to do. You know, graduate students are anxious. You know, assistant professors are anxious. Adjunct faculty are anxious. Hell, tenured professors are anxious, right? Because they know. The university wins this battle. It will have set a terrible precedent for all of us, right? It will change both the meaning and practice of academic freedom, and it will empower people who already have a tremendous amount of power in the first place, right? They don't need any more, right? You know, they, they really don't. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not very good at, at giving, giving advice. Um, I, I'm, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm just kind of, hey, you know, do whatever makes you feel comfortable kind of person. You know? uh, if you want to do something, do something. If you don't, you don't, whatever. But I, I like to think about what we can do maybe more, more conceptually than, than materially and, and, and think of it as, as an attitude and as a, a commitment that influences who, who we are on, on a day-to-day -day basis. So what can we do? We continue to, to struggle. As long as indigenous peoples who face corporate malfeasance and continued colonization, endless racism, right, the indignities right, of colonial discourses, right? broken treaties, right? misappropriated land, as long as they continue to struggle, and as long as Palestinians who face a military occupation and who face continued dispossession and who face routine slaughter of their children and other family members continue to struggle. As long as black folks who face police brutality, who continue to face anti-black racism, who continue to face housing discrimination and redlining, and who continue to be subject to brutal forms of state power continue to struggle. As long as women who face misogyny and abuse and rape culture continue to struggle. As long as the poor of the world who face the heavy, unforgiving boot of capitalism continue to struggle, so too must we. Thank you very much.